Structured ability groups, after falling out of favor from the 1970s, are making a comeback. Primaries, as well as secondaries, are adopting sets based on ability, especially for core subjects. But they don't come with any guarantee of improved achievement. That depends on how they are run and organized. One junior school, which has been singled out by Ofsted as a top 20 outstanding school, excelling against all the odds, is in no doubt that its success is due in good part to ability sets for numeracy and literacy. We visited the school to find out how setting is applied. Key to the school's approach is making the right assessment of every child and then moving them promptly upwards or downwards. The sense here is that most parents and children are happy with how it works. But of course, this isn't always the case. There's only been one case since I've been here where I've had to have a series of conversations. In the end, my point of view and the supporting data was accepted. What happens if the pupil objects? That has happened on a few occasions where the pupil has said that they really don't want to go down. And normally in that situation, certainly when it's, it's happened to me, I've been impressed that the child has really wanted to set, stay in whatever set it is. This is Berrymead School on the South Acton Estate in West London, where setting never really went away. The school splits into ability sets every morning for numeracy and literacy. Years three, four and five are divided into three, reflecting the school's three-form intake. In year six, there are four sets. It's smaller groups, more focus. We're preparing them for high school. There are lots of transitional elements. It's not just about the academic side of things. It's about building up their self-esteem, preparing them for high school and other things that they will uh, come across. So there are many things, many dimensions to year six. We visited each of the year six sets, moving from bottom to top. 100 centimetres equals eight Metre. Metre. Yeah, good. Pupils are initially placed into sets based on key stage one results. After that, progress is assessed with formal tests, every term for numeracy and every half term for literacy. This is all together. What does that tell you? Which of your operations are you going to have to use? Addition. Addition. And then, this one's a really easy one. What is, what is the sum we're going to do, Zainab? 23 and 22 and 14. Right, OK, then off we go. But there's almost continuous assessment carried out by the class teachers. It is literally done week by week as each piece of work is done literally on a daily basis, every numeracy hour, every literacy hour. So a child, if they have performed absolutely brilliantly for a week or two weeks, the teacher will notice that immediately and almost this child is too good for the work that I'm setting. Now rather than, than having an extension work within that class, far easier to promote the child, fantastic, great for confidence, and up they go to the next set up. I've got a child in my mass class, my mass middle mass set at the moment who, who has come up from the special needs set. She has done so well. We've got a test coming up next week, our QCAs, and my, my guess is that she will do really well in that and she'll go up to the top set. So within the space of about four months, she has gone from special needs to top set. And that is how flexible it is if a child really uh, does well. Well, if I say round to the nearest tenth, don't say, how many decimal places am I going to have? One. If I say round to the nearest hundred. OK, so that's what you need to remember. Right, both of you. Round that number to the nearest hundred. So how many decimal places? One. Two. Go. Of course, pupils may be moved down, but they're always told why. There's a conversation that takes place between the teachers um, and the child. So we're quite frank and open, actually, with children. We look at their targets, whether they've achieved them, we look at their data, and we'd have a frank conversation. Kelly chooses a section of a newspaper. Yes. She draws a bar chart of the number of letters in each word. What fraction of the 50 words have more than six letters? Parents are also informed in advance if their child is about to be moved. We would try and give as much of a, um, a period of time's notice so that the parent, if they were able to uh, help their children, whether it was with English or maths, some of course can't, but if they were able to do that, um, then 
they could intervene and try and encourage their child to stay in that set. If a pupil resists a move, which happens very rarely, they're often given another chance to prove themselves. It's more likely that objections come from parents. In that case, I've had extended conversations with particular parents where I've produced data and justified our position and tried to make a convincing argument that it's actually for the child's benefit, that they just have that little bit of extra support in a smaller group, in a focused way, with differentiated work, just until they make up the difference or improve. There's only been one case in recent years of a parent continuing to object after meeting staff. As we discovered from parents at the school gate, there's no lack of confidence or trust in the school. If I see something reasonable, then I don't need to complain. If I just see that there's something different, then I still have to keep on, you know, see. And then if it is needed, then I have to complain, yes, of course. How would you feel if the teachers turned around and said, I'm afraid your son is going to go down a set? Would you accept it? Um, I accept it, providing they've got some kind of, um, well, much information they can give me. So then I can work out, OK, why all of a sudden one minute he's in high set, why all of a sudden he's dropped down to middle set or low set. If he's not doing very well up, then of course the teacher will move him, but due to his capability, I wouldn't advise them to move him down until they see he's, he's underachieving. You'd accept their decision if you saw the evidence? If I see the evidence, yeah. If they moved me to a lower set, I would ask the teacher why. And if it's a good reading, I'll just leave it. This parent governor believes parents are supportive of setting because they recognise it eases the pressure on children who are newly arrived. Going into sets does help the children because they're mixing not only with their classmates but also people along the same intellectual level in particular subjects so that they don't feel they're left out at all because I think some of the small, you know, if you come in as a refugee um, and are put into a class, um, it's probably quite frightening. Um, but if you're with people who not only are you know, your same age but also same ability, I think it gives a certain stability uh, to help the learning process. Of course, the belief that low esteem and social alienation are caused by structured ability groups was a major factor in the move away from them, and one of the main reasons why this teacher opposed them. When he arrived at the school nine years ago, numeracy was taught in sets, and plans were being made to extend it to literacy, plans which he spoke against. I'd had only recently come out of being a, you know, just recently graduated as a teacher. Um, I had all the sort of ideas that I got from Roehampton, which is where I studied, where the idea really wasn't in favour of setting. And I was kind of, I was worried for the children in the lower sets, really, that they would kind of feel that they were stigmatised in a way, that they, you know, that they were no good at something, and that they would become demotivated and sort of, you know, a bit disillusioned. That was the fear, really. Did that, did that happen? Um, no, no it hasn't. I've been really, really pleasantly surprised. I'm always amazed at the confidence of the children. They are still really, really motivated. They really don't seem to feel that they're failures and, and all those fears that I had haven't, you know, I've not seen them uh, come true really. Wednesday, W-E. What kind of W? Capital W. For pupils who may feel demotivated, however, support is available to improve their self-esteem. The school organises sessions with games and tasks that pupils can do to boost their confidence. But according to the school, there's no link between attendance and being in lower sets. Although I haven't uh, done a, a correlation study of self-esteem, self-esteem groups and lower sets, I mean, I think that um, there is not um, a massive impact on self-esteem, but if there is, it's picked up by teachers and teaching assistants, and quite often it's the teaching assistants who will pick up and come to me as the Senko and say, look, I think this child would benefit from a term's worth of small group work on self-esteem or surrounding issues. There has been some discussion about extending setting to other subjects, but the school's wary about undermining the relationship between teachers and their classes. Choose or 
important part in that story, and you're going to plot them on the graph. If you go to sets for every different subject, I think you lose something. So it slightly contradicts what I'm saying. Obviously, we've, we concentrate very much on the English and maths because of the SATs. We also thought in year six, over the, the last few years when I've been head of year six, should we go to setting for science? And we decided not to do it because we thought we'd lose that special flavour of the primary school teacher with his or her class. And it is one of the very special things that any primary school teacher will know. It's my class for the year. Miss, what does evaluate me? Did it do the job that it was designed for? Yeah? What we're going to do today, we're going to do some shared writing. We're going to create an advert for Hannah's mobile phone. OK? Let's have some ideas. Drill demolition. Drill demolition. I like it. Encouraging pupils to move onwards and upwards does not create any capacity problems in the upper sets. There's always room at the top. In year six, we operate four sets uh, within three classes. So the top literacy group will have 28 children. We only have 71 in the year group. So. Unless everybody was suddenly, you know, doing ex exceedingly well, in which case we'd create two upper sets. <laughs> but there's no capacity issue. There's also a drive to improve away from the classroom. School sports teams excel in local tournaments and pupils can be seen pushing themselves in sports old and new. This pupil is a champion cup stacker, with hopes of competing in the World Championship. It's an ethos of needing to succeed that the head is keen to promote and happy to defend. There's a competitive kind of feel in virtually everything we do here. Uh, you've had a taster of our sports. Um, we've won the local sports championships for about eight years running, bar one year. It may have been considered unhealthy in the past, it may still be considered unhealthy, but we found that for our children, to have that competitive edge is vital. And high schools that they then go on to often comment that the children that come from Berrymead specifically, number one, they mingle well, number two, they're adaptable, and number three, they're actually really, really willing to succeed and to do whatever it takes to succeed. They're hard-working children. Isn't it putting children under a lot of pressure? Perhaps, but isn't that what life is about these days? It is when you're an adult, not when you're a young child. But I think um, if, it's, if it's done in a safe, secure, healthy environment, um, I think you don't end up with children who are terribly stressed about these matters. It's considered to be healthy, to be a little bit competitive. And again, it's to, it's to their ability, it's to their, their own individual needs. The ability grouping debate is bound to continue. But whether you approve or disapprove of setting, there's no denying that some children are in a class of their own.